Okay, um, that was amazing. Incredible tour de force, and really, as I said, nobody um, thinking about how to protect our country and keep it safe um, over the last 30 years since Tony Fauci. So, uh, amazing way to begin. What we're gonna do next is I'm gonna bring the first panel up, um, and we're gonna ha we have a little video. So let me line up the video while I ask our, our first panelists uh, to come up. So uh, if we could have um, Mike, uh, Dennis, Hillary, and Mosoka uh, come on up and join us. Or, um, and the first video, so we had asked Larry Summers uh, to come and offer some remarks. Larry is traveling. For those of you who don't know, he's the Elliott University professor, uh, former president of Harvard, former Treasury Secretary. So then the question is, why Larry Summers? He has been very deeply engaged in this and thinking about this and cares a lot about this. I was gonna say, I realize you guys may not be able to see the video from sitting up there, so it's up to you if you wanna, either way. Um, and so Larry was kind enough to record a video for us. And it's about six minutes, we're gonna watch it, uh, and then I will introduce our panelists and we'll get started on our first panel. I welcome the Harvard Global Health Initiative's review of what happened a century ago with the flu pandemic and its effort to look forward to mitigating the risks and the consequences of future pandemics. I am convinced that pandemic flu is the least focused on of major global challenges. Vast efforts and concern surround nuclear proliferation. Vast efforts appropriately are directed to issues around global climate change. Taking the risks over time of pandemic, I believe that the consequences are similar in terms of total economic impact, in terms of lives lost, to the risks associated with climate change and the risks associated with nuclear proliferation. And yet, pandemic risk is a obsession for specialists, a preoccupation of those concerned with insurance and reinsurance, but a much less mainstream issue than nuclear proliferation or global climate change. And so I believe that this initiative that reminds us that more people died in the flu epidemic after World War I than died as a consequence of World War I, that reminds us of how profoundly society was changed by a disease that took the strongest rather than the weakest uh, among us, those who were young or of uh, middle age, is something that is very, very important. We certainly have made immense progress in the biomedical sciences over the last century, and that is a positive development with respect to pandemic risks. On the other hand, we live in a much, much smaller and much, much more interconnected world, which means that disease vectors will be transmitted that much more rapidly. Full quarantines will be that much more difficult. We live in a world that faces too much superstition, propaganda, dare I say it, fake news and confusion with respect to vaccination, which has to be at the center of any effort to control uh, epidemics and uh, pandemics. And we live in a world where too often the preoccupation is with the urgent rather than with the profoundly important. And that diverts us too from preparing for the next uh, pandemic. I believe that this is a central challenge that deserves far more global attention 
than it is now receiving. And I'm glad to see Harvard's Global Health Initiative do its part to arouse concern, prompt study and reflection, and drive preparation for the epidemics and pandemics that are all too likely to come, albeit unpredictably, at some point in the future. Great. Um, so, as I said, you know, we have, most people in this room have been thinking about and working on these issues. Um, but Larry Summers, who has thought broadly, has worked obviously across a variety of sectors and, and is one of the leading economists and I think uh, public intellectuals, um, has glommed onto something that is really a, a, a key issue, um, which is that this is not a specialized issue. This is not a healthcare issue. This is not a, a, an issue that, that um, specialists need to obsess on. And the point he makes, that if you think about the things that can cause catastrophic uh, harm to human society, right? Global climate change is more slow moving, but if you think about things like uh, a nuclear weapon going off in a major city, terrorist threats, um, we spend enormous amount of resources, and rightly so, on understanding those risks and mitigating those risks. And then when we switch to something like pandemics, it drops way down and we start thinking about, well, do we really have the money to afford it? Can we really make the investments? So that's part of the challenge that we're dealing with. And so our first panel for today uh, is an extraordinary panel, and I'm going to very quickly turn it over to them. I'm going to do very quick introductions. This is about understanding and mitigating risks. And so the first panel, um, for those of you who've been with us, you've seen Mike Osterholm uh, join us. So thank you again for coming back, Mike. Um, he's the director of SIDRA at the University of Minnesota. And as I described him a couple of days ago, um, when uh, the country faces challenges, he's one of the uh, on the short list of experts we turn to, um, as he was uh, after 2001. Uh, Dennis Carroll, next to him, is the director of the USAID Global Health Security and Development Unit um, and has been deeply involved in these issues. USAID, uh, when we talk about the importance of global health security, we often talk about you know, CDC and NIH and the global health security agenda. USAID has been a very central role, part of this, and it's really been from Dennis's leadership. Um, Hillary Carter, next to him, is the director for counter-biological uh, threats at the National Security Council, has been uh, working on global issues, not just global health issues, but global issues uh, for quite a long time, um, uh, is a PhD from Georgetown. And then next to her is Mosoka Fala, um, whose official title is D Deputy Director of uh, General and Technical Services at the National Public Health Institute uh, in Liberia. Um, what he really is, he's been a, a close friend of the Institute for many years. Um, is one of the people who was central to turning around the Ebola outbreak in Liberia. Um, and he did it through a combination of both incredible intellect, but also personal integrity and trust and uh, working with the community quite directly and has been um, a colleague, friend, and a hero of mine. So I was thrilled to have Masoka join us. So why don't I um, turn it over to Mike? I think everybody's just gonna make some reflections. Um, up to you, do you wanna come up here? Why don't you come up? I think people can see it a little bit better if you're up there. I'll sit, and then, um, we'll, then we'll have a discussion. Good morning, and thank you again for the invitation to be here this week. It has been really, truly a remarkable experience over the course of the last four days, and I just want to thank the organizers for the vision uh, to put this kind of a meeting on. Uh, let me begin by saying that uh, I'm as usual, want to kind of send this meeting to a topsy-turvy moment. <laughs> um, I, I would like to challenge the notion of what we talk about when we talk about pandemics and epidemics, and there's some, a very real reason why. It's not a semantic issue. It's an actual response issue in a key way. Uh, we often throw around the term pandemics and epidemics, and we intermix them, and I think that's at our own peril. To my mind, and I tried to discuss this in some length, the justification and the background for it in my book, uh, Deadliest Enemies, Our War Against Killer Germs, last year, I believe that there really are only two disease categories that rank in the category of pandemic. Remember, a pandemic is a worldwide epidemic, meaning every country, every region, every continent has the chance to have the same problem happen as does any other one. Obviously, first and foremost is influenza. 
Just to remind people, and Tony showed a nice slide up here, but our group went back and looked at this carefully, and by the time that the first isolate of H1N1 was identified in California in April of 2009, we now recognize that that virus was in at least 27 countries for certain, and maybe as many as 43 countries. It had moved that quickly around the world. That's a pandemic. The second category, I would say, is an unusual one in that it's not a disease in of itself. We are facing truly a pandemic of antimicrobial resistance, which is a pan-pandemic in the sense that on a worldwide basis, it's happening every day, everywhere. Some organisms may be more prominent in some areas of the world, but it's just a matter of time. Beyond that, all these diseases we're talking about are really what I call diseases of critical regional importance. Ebola is absolutely critical to sub-Saharan Africa. But will Ebola become a major disease problem in the Americas? No, not likely. Now, could we have cases, as we talked about, and I mentioned in my previous presentation the other day, that what kills us versus what hurts us versus what concerns us versus what scares us can all be very different. And we saw that with Ebola in the United States. But from an impact statement, that's very, very important to distinguish. Let me give you an example. We live today in a global economy that we are so dependent on others out there to supply to us what we need every day. As of this morning, Pre-hospital drug shortages in this country, meaning what's on the emergency room uh, cart, what's on the ambulance cart, right now we have 189 drugs that are either absolutely not available or in critical short supply. Many of them are absolutely life-saving drugs. Why is that in part? Because almost all of them are generic, almost all are made in China, and the business model has been set up to make cover the mode, cover the mean. Don't try to cover shortages, et cetera, it's too much money to have that much pant capacity. If you wanted today to go to war with China, and for anyone here in the room from China, I hope that never happens, they would need to fire one bullet to put their drug supply hands around our neck and strangle us. Our military is totally dependent on these same drug shortage drugs that we as a public are dependent on. When the situation happened uh, with the Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, Everybody seems so surprised that we had this big shortage of IV bags all of a sudden. I gave a talk four years ago in which I predicted the next F4, F5 hurricane to hit Puerto Rico was going to take down our ability to supply IV bags because 80% of the world's capacity to make them were all on that island. Should we have been surprised? The reason I bring this up is because from a pandemic standpoint, those diseases which impact those kinds of critical supplies will impact the rest of the world. And from a health standpoint, let me just say right now, for the 690,000 Americans that are, have chronic renal problems and are either on dialysis or drugs, which are almost virtually all coming from China, anything that shuts down certain parts of the world's ability to move product, make product, distribute product, is going to have collateral damage second to none. That's why we have to distinguish between pandemics and epidemics of critical regional importance. And so I think whether, and last night you heard me comment on the issue around vaccines, what we're talking about is a shortage of epidemic vaccines, vaccines that are going to handle those diseases of critical regional importance with the exception of the issue of uh, influenza. Now let me just say one last thing for some in the room sitting here saying, well, HIV and TB, aren't they all pandemics? Actually, by technical definition, they're not anymore. They were at one time, HIV in particular, but now it's endemic disease. In some cases it's hyperendemic, but it's not a new condition. Suddenly we're not going to see major social, political, and economic implications because of HIV that will disrupt that area of the world beyond what it's already doing. In some cases it's a horrible situation in parts of the world. TB is a horrible situation, but it's not going to change the political nature. So I think today as we talk about these, it is important to distinguish about what really causes a pandemic, a worldwide epidemic of a new disease versus those of critical regional importance, which can be very, very important, but they have totally different implications. We never worried about the impact on our US drug supply or the European drug supply with Ebola in West Africa. We worried about a lot of other things, but not that. But a pandemic that shut down global trade and travel would, in fact, be a very substantial problem. Thank you.
talk uh, sort of about one of the maps that Tony just showed, uh, which was the second map that showed the enormous diversity of emerging infectious diseases that have come up over the course of his career over the last 30 years. And what we need to understand is that virtually all of those agents that showed up on those maps, they pre-existed in wildlife on this planet before they made it in to us. We live in an ecosystem where the interface in between wildlife, livestock, and people is such an incredibly dynamic process that a deep reservoir of an extraordinarily diverse pool of viruses that have been resident in uh, wildlife forever are now the dynamics are changing. And what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about that relationship between zoonotic diseases, those diseases that um, have their genesis in wildlife spilling over into people. And I would also like just to pick up on AMR, that it is not a zoonotic disease, but what we also know about AMR is that the drivers behind AMR are not simply the events that occur within prescriber user practices within clinical settings. That 90% of all antibiotics consumed within the United States by weight are done within livestock. So as we think about how we protect and preserve sort of the well-being of our population, we need to understand that it's not just about humans or homo sapiens. It's about how we sit within the larger ecology on this planet. So there are five points I'd like to make. First off, even as we talk about zoonosis, it is nothing new. All of those diseases that we see spilling out over the last 30 years is not a new dynamic that, in fact, many of the infectious diseases that are part of the global burden today had their genesis in wildlife. Malaria, tuberculosis, and as uh, Mike just pointed out, HIV. And it's worth noting that while we're here uh, remembering the 100th anniversary of the uh, great pandemic of 1918, in another two to four years, it'll be the 100th anniversary of the spillover of the uh, progenitor virus from simian populations and people that unleashed HIV in the world. And so we live in a place where zoonosis is a very much part of our normal landscape, point one. But point two is that it's not a steady state. The dynamics of emergence, spillover, spread within human populations today is radically different in the 21st century than in any other point. Someone mentioned earlier today that if we were here in Boston 100 years ago, the world's population was 1.5 billion people. Think about it. As a species, it took us 400,000 years, plus or minus, to get to that 1 billion mark. In the space of 100 years, we've added another 6 billion people. And by the time we get to the end of this century, we'll add on another five. You can't have that kind of accelerated footprint on this planet without having a hugely disruptive effect on that ecosystem dynamic with wildlife, livestock, and people. So we live in a different space. And as we think about the 21st century, this is a period of great epidemiologic transition driven by population pressures that will play themselves out in ways both at the pandemic but at the epidemic level as well. That said, as we look to the 21st century as a place of extraordinarily dynamic risk, it's safe to say we are not prepared. We remain ill-prepared. Despite extraordinary efforts over the last decade to build systems and capacities around the world to deal with preventing, detecting, and responding, the truth of the matter is we're ultimately held hostage to the fact that our toolbox of response is an enormously inadequate one. And Tony sort of touched upon it when he spoke to the challenges we have in terms of developing countermeasures in the midst of an event. And while he talked about influenza in 2009, it's worth noting that by the end of 2009, we may have had enough to provide 
maximum protection for the American population. But 12 months after the emergence of H1N1, the total amount of vaccine that had been produced worldwide would have protected 17% of the world's population. Two billion people by that time had been infected. There's, an, there's a dislink between what we're capable of doing in terms of developing countermeasures after emergence towards having maximum impact, not just on the people within the United States, but the global community, those 7.6 <coughs> billion people that live on this planet. Why are we still so ill-prepared? Why is that toolbox so fragile? And I go to the last point on, um, again, Tony's slide, where he talked about vaccine strategy. And he talked about the prototype strategy, which is not to simply look within the Flavy viruses at developing a vaccine against Zika or yellow fever um, or uh, Dengue, which we know do not cross-react with each other. It's beginning to rethink what we know about the relationships within those viral families and use broad data um, analysis across families to be able to think about broad-spectrum countermeasures for the first time. But the weak link in that strategy is that for the six or so examples that he put up there for the Flavy virus, we know that there's somewhere on the order of 6,000 other Flavy viruses circulating in wildlife. Same thing for um, filoviruses, Ebola's. Same thing for retroviruses. We live in a world where the pool of viruses which are circulating that we will become increasingly more acquainted with in the 21st century. We've only seen 0.1% of all of those viruses. So I will turn you to my last point. The opportunity we have is to be transformative. Move beyond what are the agent-specific interventions, going after Ebola, going after yellow fever, and begin turning the sciences for emerging viral diseases from what are really low data sciences, almost mom and pop sciences, into big data. What would it take? First, in fact, go out and characterize those other 6,000 Flavy viruses that are out there that are currently circulating in wildlife. What would it take for us to be able to go out and characterize the 6,000 um, filoviruses? The opportunity is extraordinary. We are not limited by technology. What we are limited by is political will. And we know from work that we've done in partnership with many in this room over the last decade, the feasibility of actually going out into wildlife, collecting those samples, and beginning that characterization, both in terms of their genetic and their ecologic profiles, allow us to transform the sciences of emerging viral diseases from a small agent-specific science into broad spectrum, family level, virome level sciences. Final point, Albert Einstein famously observed that doing the same thing over and over again is the definition of madness. We're not mad, but we are simply, when we think about what's our plan B to plan A, we usually say, we'll do plan A better. What we're arguing for is to transform what we think about plan B and open up the gauge. Think about the role of this ecosystem we sit in, wildlife, livestock, and people, and use that understanding to begin to transform the questions we're asking and the investments we're making. Thank you. That was terrific. Thank you, Dennis. And one quick correction before I go ask Hillary, which is I got your alma mater wrong. Your PhD is from Vanderbilt, and no offense meant, but as soon as I said it, I said, I think that's wrong. Yeah. So my apologies. Um, but I'm still completely thrilled that you're here. And um, your opening thoughts on, on where you're sitting at the National Security Council thinking about these issues. Great. Thank you very much. And I was going to correct that because I can't... Uh, discredit my alma mater Vanderbilt if there's any doors in the room. So um, thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to be here. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today. 
And a big thanks to the Harvard Global Health Institute for convening this outbreak week and convening this symposium today. This is an incredibly important opportunity to discuss, come together and discuss uh, options that we have for the future to reduce these risks. So today I've been asked to speak about the policy and strategy development work that the US government has done as it relates to biodefense and global health security. So my comments will be <clears throat> mostly focused on that. And I look forward to the discussion if there's any any further uh, questions. So first, let me start by saying that we believe that strategies are important and that strategies should empower implementation. Biological threats, where they, whether they are deliberate, accidental, or naturally occurring, are among the most serious threats to US national security. And I don't need to tell this audience this. This audience knows it very well. Infectious disease threats do not respect borders and in our interconnected world can spread rapidly independent of origin. Biological threats are a distinct aspect of national security and require a focused and systematic approach to reducing risks. It's a vital interest of the United States government to prevent, prepare for, respond to, and recover from biological threats. In December of 2017, the White House released a national security strategy which calls for combating biological threats and pandemics. There are three priority actions underneath uh, this particular uh, end state, and it, they are detecting and countering biological threats at the source, so global health security, supporting biomedical innovation, and improving emergency response, which entails domestically understanding and characterizing the outbreak to limit the spread of disease. I highlight the national security strategy in this form in particular for two reasons. One, the national security strategy articulates the US government view that health security is national security. And two, by including it in the national security strategy, it uh, indicates that protecting health security is a national security priority. I'll now turn to the most recently released strategy, which is our national biodefense strategy. On September 18th, 2018, so just last week, the White House released the National Biodefense Strategy and its Implementation Plan. And the President signed a National Security Presidential Memorandum, which is a presidential directive, on support for biodefense. And biodefense in this context is, described, is defined very broadly. Um, that looks at actions to counter biological threats and reduce risks, and includes global health security and domestic health security. The biodefense strategy identifies five goals. The first is to assess biological risks. The second is to ensure capabilities to prevent biological incidents. The third is to prepare to reduce the impacts of biological incidents. And the fourth is to respond rapidly to biological incidents. And then the fifth and final goal is recovering after biological incidents. This strategy integrates the activities of more than 15 departments and agencies, and it's comprehensive in four different ways. The first is that by threat, it for the first time encompasses naturally occurring accidental and deliberate biological threats, bringing those into one comprehensive strategy. The second is by target, it addresses threats to humans, to animals, to plants, and to the environment. The third is that by geography, it looks both here domestically in the United States, but also internationally. As we know, biological threats are borderless threats. Four, by discipline, the strategy takes a multi-sectoral approach and addresses different sectors, including health, law enforcement, defense and security, uh, emergency response, science and technology, and others. Included in the annex of the National Biodefense Strategy is its implementation plan, as I mentioned. And the implementation plan provides granularity for the objectives and the goals and describes in greater detail the actions that the US government will take to strengthen its biodefense. And for this audience in particular, I encourage you to look at the implementation plan because that's where the meat of the descriptions are on the different actions. Also, I mentioned that the President signed a National Security Presidential Memorandum. And this presidential directive directs the execution of the strategy and the execution of the implementation plan. And further, it lays out a framework for coordinating the broader biodefense enterprise. I'll go through the structure, and I'll go through the annual process, and then I'll get to the so what, what does it mean? Because I think it is really uh, we are hoping to create something that's responsive to some of the things that you heard Dennis raise, that you heard Mike raise, and that you heard Dr. Fauci raise this morning. So the structure is as follows. The Secretary of Health and um, Human Services, Secretary Azar, is designated as the federal lead for coordinating implementation of the strategy. The Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs, who is my boss, the National Security Advisor, is the lead for coordination and integration of policy for all biodefense efforts. 
The presidential directive also creates a uh, principal level, so cabinet secretary level, biodefense coordination uh, steering committee, biodefense steering committee, uh, which includes eight cabinet officials. And then there's also a team created within the Department of Health and Human Services to support those principals and those cabinet officials. The Biodefense Steering Committee and the Biodefense Coordination Team have a mandate to reach outside the federal government to non-governmental stakeholders, including academia, international organizations, international partners, and to ensure their activities are uh, coordinated with the broader uh, federal government activities. There's also the annual process. The, the annual process, I won't describe it in detail, but it does a few things. It's tailored to understand what the US government is doing to counter biological risks, to assess if those activities are meeting the goals as defined in the strategy, and then to annually determine what our policy priorities are and link this policy prioritization process to the annual budget. And so, so what? What's the significance of this strategy and why um, you know, did we put this out and go to the trouble? So first and foremost, I think what you're seeing is an elevation of biodefense and priority. You heard no, numerous panelists here today talk about why don't we give biological threats the same attention that we give um, other uh, actions. I think what you're seeing here is an elevation of this in priority. Um, second, for the first time, we do have and we've established a federal lead, which again is the Secretary of Health and Human Services for the comprehensive strategy and coordinating these actions. And then third, it gets at uh, the strategy and the process gets at annually analyzing the gaps in preparedness across the U.S. government and then developing policy priorities to close those gaps. And so you heard. Dr. Fauci this morning talked about biological threats or perpetual threats. He said emerging um, infections, but I'll expand those to all biological threats. Um, you heard Mike talk about distinguishing between a pandemic and an epidemic. You heard Dennis talk about our inadequate response toolbox. What we're trying to do with this strategy is create a structure to understand what we're doing, understand what we're not doing, and then prioritize our actions accordingly in the years to come. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Hillary. That's really helpful. Uh, Are you going to go up there? Yeah. That's great. Thank you. And sorry about the PhD. I don't know where I got that. Thank you very much, Ashis. Uh, I'm going to be speaking briefly about some of the epidemics. Mike, can you speak into the microphone? Oh, okay, sorry. That's fine. I'm going to be speaking briefly about it, the trace of epidemics that we've had since Ebola ended. The two things I want to say, um, infectious disease anywhere is infectious disease everywhere. And we have to be cognizant of the fact. Yellow fever in Angola spread to Europe. Less than a week ago, monkey passed from the UK, from Nigeria into the UK, and people got infected. We face this issue every day. Neglected spots of today are the hard spots of tomorrow. So I have this map that tends to show you the level of preparedness in the West African region towards uh, epidemic preparedness. You see predominantly most of the countries in the West African region are in red. There's no level of preparedness. And if you establish with me the, the premise I have laid that infectious disease anywhere is everywhere, that the neglected spot of today are the hot spot of tomorrow, you can see except that Liberia and other countries in yellow are making some progress due to the lesson learned from Ebola, and also want to recognize the World Bank effort on the Redisi grant that is trying to do regional surveillance. There is so much investment into regional surveillance, uh, treating the epidemiologists of tomorrow, building laboratory capacity is a very good step in the way forward because if you understand infectious disease, like I monitor what's going on in the DRC, it worries me every day. Uh, I'm watching the trend, and I, I hate to say this, but I'm so convinced that there's a bigger threat that it could spill over in the other country for a potential situation because we saw all the errors that happened in Liberia repeating themselves in the DRC. The resistance, the military, error. so there's a perfect sum there. So we want to acknowledge the investment, but this can tell you the situation in West Africa. I will now narrow down to Liberia. If you compare 2017 to 2018, you begin to see that there are increasing cases of outbreaks that includes Lhasa, that in, as I speak to you this very moment, Yellow fuel has been diagnosed in the southeastern part of my country. Lhasa, we have had consistent spread of 
measles in the country. We have had re-emerging of new diseases. Are we seeing the increase in outbreaks because of Ebola and we have enhanced our surveillance capacity? Uh, Dr. Cash, Richard Cash is here, used to say to us, when you look for it, you will find it. Are we finding because we are looking for it? But it shows you that there are increasing outbreak in Liberia. I want you to watch carefully what's happening. Over three years period, we've seen increasing cases of Lhasa. In Liberia, we have, like Dr. Fauci said, Lhasa was restricted to certain seasons of the year and certain era we call the Lhasa Belt. But for the last couple of years, there is breakage down from the Lhasa Belt to more counties. Not only that, but we are also beginning to see that it is lasting more longer. And because it is lasting longer, we are having more cases of Lhasa. I share this slide. If you look across three years, you watch the number of cases we've had. The number of confirmed cases, you will see that in 2018, the case fatality rate has increased as a function of the number of cases, the severity of the disease. And that continues to tell you that we're going to face greater threat every day. Not only are we seeing that the epidemiology and the biology of diseases that we knew are changing and posing more threats and killing more people, but we begin to see re-emergence of new disease. Yes, we begin to see, you see monkey pass. Since the 70th, monkey pass was essentially eliminated from Liberia and West Africa. Last year, we began to see new cases of monkey pox across the country, spread across the country. Monkey pox is no more restricted to Liberia, but we see cases in Sierra Leone. We see cases in Liberia, Central African Republic, and as I said to you, Nigeria, where two cases got imported to the UK and someone in the UK got infected. So the chances of, you know, I always say to people, I can have breakfast here today and I can have my, my dinner in Liberia with the global travel. I can be incubating a disease this very moment from the US and I will be in Liberia and spread it. We saw that happening with Ebola. Okay, another case here, for a long time we were blessed, Liberia was also of the meningitis belt. All of a sudden we're in a conference in the US, the Minister of Health, we had a cluster of death. Eight persons died from symptom onset to severity to death 24 hours. We were very confused. All of a sudden, we thought it was Ebola. We went around through metagenomic sequencing at the CDC we realized that it was septicemia meningitis serotype C. This was not expected in Liberia. Liberia was not in the epidemic belt, the meningitis belt. All of a sudden, it went back. And the, tail, and the most important one that is so critical from a global health perspective was the one in the Northwest. This is the boundary between Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone, the red circle where Ebola started from. This is where we had a big outbreak. And to make it more interesting, the outbreak was ongoing during the inauguration of our new president, where international guests were flying in, the airplanes were coming into Liberia. We had to deal with the issue of information management, keeping the outbreak contained. We had to move in massively with ciprofloxacin, and were able to treat over 1,000 people to prevent a spillover into Sierra Leone and into Guinea and to ensure that we kept the, the outbreak continued so it wouldn't come to Morovia where we had thousands of guests, presidents and ministers were there at a meeting. So outbreak anywhere is everywhere. What are some of the threats? So I gave you, I gave you the fact that we still have a threat. The, the biology of the disease is changing. The epidemiology is changing. Global travel facilitated the disease. But there are threats. I tend to show this slide. Ebola has helped us a lot with build a resilience system. We have a huge support where we have surveillance system in the country, but the two did I show you was a point in time where some of the support we get from international do not stop coming and the workers went on strike. So there is still a fragile system. The system that is so heavily do not dependent. That system gets so fragile that whatever happens tomorrow in the midst of do not support, it drops. How do we transition to develop sustainable financing for healthcare is a critical issue. The second threat is that we've done um, an assessment of our emergency stock, PPEs and gloves. If we were to have an outbreak tomorrow, you'd be surprised to know PPEs and gloves are now zero in country. These are all fragile systems that tell us in the midst of increasing outbreaks, you begin to see that major logistics are absent or run, are out of stock. What that simply means tomorrow, if we had an outbreak of Ebola, say, in northwestern Liberia, that is impossible because of bar road, we don't even have PPE. 
is a way to reshape the model. And so much has been invested in this country. Library alone from Ebola got $1.5 billion investment. How we think of sustaining uh, an investment in the country? Um, so I will shift gear. One of the ways we've done investment now is to create these national public health institutes. I was one of those who helped to form the Public Health Institute of Liberia. I went to Thailand, I went to Norway to study that system, and we built a public health institute from the lesson we learned from Ebola that the Ministry of Health cannot, cannot be focused on healthcare delivery and preventing threats. So we developed this institute to narrowly focus on threats, on surveillance and diagnostics, and building capacity. This concept has now spread across Africa. There is a African CDC and there are regional CDCs with the goal of building core public health capacity for surveillance and response. With funding from the World Bank and other institutions, we begin to make substantial progress. And that's the only way we can save infectious disease in these neglected spots from coming to the developed spots. In order to mitigate the risks, it's an investment in laboratory system, diagnostic system. I was involved in Ebola. I was in Liberia at the time, having completed school in the US when Ebola struck Liberia. We literally had to take the samples to the border with Guinea, cross them in a canoe, drive them to Kodakri, and bring the result back to Liberia for five to seven days. There was absolutely no capacity to diagnose. So those are the factors that spiral. With support from Panama and the CDC, you see now we are able to diagnose priority diseases, like LASA. Priority diseases, the last time, and so that gave us a, a complete speed in the management of any epidemic threat. I tell people every day, speed, 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 and communication are the two critical factors. With the ability for diagnostic capacity in country, we can now diagnose and respond to outbreak immediately. The second most important investment is an investment in the surveillance system, the public health capacity. You, if you look at the time, most of our outbreak now, we are responding with less than two days which is the standard set by WHO. You see, all in we have zero now because we have built the human capacity, we have been investment. That's the way we mitigate the risks. Finding the core human capacity, training them, and supporting them to be in country before the, the expert can fly in. And we clearly have shown that our turnaround time are quicker, so we are able to continue our breaks from spilling over. Finally, I just have this point. The international community have learned their lesson from Ebola, I have to admit, and some efforts have been made. One has been the joint external evaluation, where there is panel to panel evaluation where we stand. As a result of the national, the JEE, we now have the National Action Plan for Health. For Liberia alone, the Action Plan of Health has been costed. It will take $150 million investment to prepare Liberia for sustainable financing for outbreaks, for preventing, for vaccine over five years. Of course, we've been part of the Global Health Security Agenda, thanks greatly to USAID in Liberia. We've invested in the one half approach. Um, my colleague Epstein will tell us in the one half approach, we have a coordinating mechanism with the highest political support, with the vice president of my country serving as the head of the one half. Um, we have gotten involved into integrated disease surveillance and response. A uh, lack of time, I can't go into that, but it's this framework developed for the Afro region to support IHR. Um, and the last point I want to speak to is the fact that we now have documented that clinical research can be used as a response. Uh, Cleveland and I have now written an article that we tend to submit to Lancet and show from the laborious example that clinical research can be a component part of a response. And we see the very same thing is going to be happening in the DRC, where they're trying to do these three arm therapeutics. The work of Preview NIH in Liberia is a clarion example that there can be connection between developing and developed countries to build sustainable capacity. We are running over nine clinical trials in Liberia and the PR on three of those trials we are published in high impact journal. It can be done. And the close, I will say that infectious disease anywhere is infectious disease everywhere, and the neglected spot of today are the hard spot of tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Masota. And a reminder of just how much progress Liberia has made uh, just in a couple of very short years. But as you said, still remains a very fragile system um, that can be quickly put, put at risk. Um, so I'm going to ask a couple of quick questions, then I'll open it up to the audience. And my first question is, is a point that several of you uh, hit on, um, but we have spent very little time talking about this week, and which is antimicrobial resistance. Um, it, as an issue, comes right up to the issues that we have been talking about around outbreaks. Um, I would argue that it sort of belongs in, inside the tent of this conversation, but reasonable people can disagree. Um, 
Given the focus on pandemic influenza that we've had, but really just as a model for threats uh, that can quickly harm human health, um, I'd love it if we could all just comment on um, antimicrobial resistance, how big a threat it is and how big of a challenge it is, and whether the tools that we are thinking about um, from surveillance systems, uh, building better vaccines, all of the stuff we've been talking about, to what extent is that helpful in this conversation? Or does AMR need a different set of strategies? And I know several of you talk, touched on it. And Hillary, as you've thought about the, the national um, global health security strategy, biosecurity strategy, to what extent has AMR played into that conversation? And then Mosoka, when we um, get to you, as you guys have thought about your surveillance systems um, for these very classic uh, diseases, what about AMR as a threat to the population of Liberia? So I, I won't ask any more. I think I've laid out the question. I'll start with Mike, and then if we can just go down the, the road. Well, first of all, I think we have to just really come to grips with the reality that like earthquakes, hurricanes, and tsunamis, antimicrobial resistance occurs. Um, a very fascinating study that was done uh, a few years ago when a group of researchers went back into one of the most distant areas of Carlsbad Caverns, an area that had not ever seen human contact before 400 million years back in time. And when they sampled the walls aseptically, they not only recovered a whole number of bacteria, but they found that the bacteria were resistant to 14 of our current leading antibiotics we have today. And you say, well, how did that happen? Well, they were all along competing for space and food as bacteria, and they had their own evolutionary pressure that brought them to develop similar resistance issues to what we today capture relative to our modern antibiotics. So this has been happening. What we've done is we've put it on steroids, in a sense, by the dumping of the amount of, of antibiotic into the environment that we have, whether it's through humans, whether it's through animals, whatever. And so what we have to understand is, from an evolutionary standpoint, this is going to happen. It is happening, and it's only going to get worse. It's accelerating. And I think that to the extent that we, for a long time, have predicted severe challenges around animal recovery resistance, we're now just really beginning to realize in depth the extent to which it's impacting treatment of disease, clinical outcome, how it's being used to cover for poor sanitation, et cetera, which then just accelerates the problem, and the role that the food supply plays. I just would add one last piece. I think one of the areas that's going to come back and be a real challenge for us also is, and I think this clearly has been well described recently in the microbiome studies, antimicrobials have a lot of downsides to humans that we never appreciated. Clearly, they've had a lot of upsides. They have been life-saving in so many ways. But the relationship between those gut bacteria or those skin bacteria that we've evolved with over the last hundreds of thousands of years were very critical in terms of the human physiologic response and the signaling that goes on between them. And when we came in and started altering that with antimicrobials, we've actually created a whole other set of human health problems. And I think that, that we are going to learn one day that how we use antimicrobials to reduce the risk of infectious disease is going to be critical. To just very briefly say to your question, yes, we need whole new strategies. We, and, and when I say we, it's the world. You know, if we don't take this on globally, and to follow up on the point just made, if there's a disease anywhere, it'll be everywhere. We're seeing that with antimicrobial resistance. You know, the Chinese introduced colistin into the hog population four years ago, and before we knew it overnight, colistin-resistant bacteria were around the world. And so I think that to the extent that we also deal with this, it can't be a coalition of the willing. It has to be a complete worldwide effort, because otherwise we'll just continue to accelerate it. Great. And Dennis, as you answer this, I'm going to put one more little spin on it, which is so as a practicing physician, I feel like I get bombarded with antibiotic stewardship. And yet I hear 90% 90, 90 of antibiotics by weight is in the farming sector. And so like, whose fault is it? Is it mine or is it theirs? Like, how do we apportion blame between me uh, versus our food supply and our food industry and our farming industry. And I'm not really trying to portion blame, but I'm trying to get a sense of, from your perspective, as you think about zoonoses, as you think about um, AMR, um, where are the major sources of that evolutionary 
uh, stress that are creating these problems? Well, it's unfortunately in both categories, and they do accelerate different kinds of problems. Uh, the animal husbandry industry clearly has contributed a substantial amount, and there's been a defensive posture there that has made it very difficult for us to try to deal with that issue, but humans have contributed their own. Um, I would also add, though, that what we don't understand is on the global level, whether it's animals or humans, antibiotics are like candy. They are basically the first, second, and third line of medical care is to go to your local quote-unquote store because, frankly, they don't have access to health care. And because of the diseases, particularly of low- and middle-income countries, this becomes by default what you do. So that has to also be added. Let me just add one last piece because I was involved with this and some of the people know about this. Just last week we made an announcement. There turns out that there is a very major trade in dogs being sold in pet stores throughout the United States. And as a result of the exchange that goes on between these animal breeders and so forth, we now have bred a strain of Campylobacter that we have no antibiotics for. If you get infected with this thing, good luck. And we have seen numerous infections, particularly in young children that have been very severe and acute, that we don't have anything to treat it with and it's now part of the dog breeding industry in the United States. So there's an example where it wasn't even livestock, it was pets and, and the concern that we have with it. Let me first bring the discussion back to 1918 because what's the difference between 1918 and if a similar virus were to emerge in 2018 or this upcoming spring of 2019? And in 1918, what didn't we have? We didn't have antibiotics, we didn't have antivirals, we didn't have vaccines. Uh, if we were to have a similar event, for as long as it takes to get the vaccine, we would still have antivirals and antibiotics. And that's significant because when you look retrospectively at 1918, you know, half or so of the deaths were due to the virus, half were secondary bacterial infections. So antivirals and antibiotics would be a very fast frontline uh, response. If we move into a, you know, a post-antibiotic world, we're moving back to 1918. And so just to tie the circle back, you know, the vulnerabilities are extraordinary. Uh, the other about, you know, what's the relative balance of influence at livestock, aquaculture, human, environmental, we don't know. And largely because we've spent a lot of our effort over the last uh, two decades really zeroing in on clinical practices, right, prescriber users. There's, there's a big black hole out there in terms of what's the contributing uh, factors around animal husbandry, aquaculture, and environmental contamination in an environment where, as Mike said, you already have a, just a natural dynamic of evolution within uh, bacteria. We don't know, and that's one of the really important One Health agendas, which is to bring a much deeper evidence base to understanding what are the relative contributions, because it talks about risk mitigation, and you really need to be smart about that, because Mother Nature is doing her own, independent of us, evolution as well. Right. Hillary, how have you guys thought about this in the national strategies? Yeah, so I will add a, uh, just a few things to the comments my um, colleagues made. And that is when I, from my perspective, we think of things in terms of policy. How do we put in place policies? How do we mobilize uh, the, either the US government or the global community um, towards specific actions? And AMR will certainly continue to be a critically important issue. Um, and so from the vantage point of organizing actions, one of the effective ones has been the global health security agenda, which you heard um, Osaka mention in terms of a group of over 60 countries working together towards specific um, technical actions as defined in the joint external evaluation. And AMR is one of the action packages under GHSA. There is a working group that is, it's a global working group that is very active and they're trying to identify different new solutions and trying to uh, put in place actions to counter this problem. But it certainly will continue to be a um, 
a critical issue. And I'll just take a moment, since you asked about the global health security strategy, which I didn't have time to mention in my previous remarks. Um, we've been, the National Security Council in particular, has been tasked with coordinating the development of a global health security strategy. Uh, this was in the FY18 omnibus. And so we are working on that. Um, there are specific things that it asks the US government to do. Um, but we're, we're taking a comprehensive approach, similar to what we did with biodefense, um, to look at how do we define global health security? What does it include? Um, and does it go beyond um, some of the things that we've traditionally thought of? So that's all I can say at this point, but it's a really great opportunity to think through these issues and specific to uh, global health security. Great. Thank you. Uh, with respect to surveillance for antimicrobial resistance, we did a rough analysis of the total number of acute fibro case illnesses in Liberia for one year. We found out there were about 2.5 million cases of fever. Of the 2.5 million cases, 1 million of those cases were confirmed to be malaria and were treated accordingly. The rest of the 1.5 million were treated with antibiotics presumptuously. So basically, there were no causative agent discovered, but they were giving antibiotics. So that's telling you the level of the lack of stewardship for antibiotics in the country. The second challenge is that there is a lack of data. And so because we, have, we lack data, it's hard to convince the stakeholders. I think just about a week ago, I sent an email back because I'm trying to commission a research to look at antibiotics or susceptibility among children under five with diarrheal diseases. It hasn't even gained traction. We have begun some initial discussion with GLASS in Sweden to begin traction. So basically, this is Liberia, but in many of the African countries, uh, antibiotics stewardship and the treatment presumptuously by doctors. I mean, doctors, like our teaching hospital does not have a microbiology lab for now. What we, have, what we train doctors. So it's not taken as serious as it should be taken. And so that's a big threat that is going to happen all across Africa. If I add, lastly, is the issue of fake drug with lack of active substance that comes into this country and needs to be controlled and regulated. And so uh, we're just starting. We, we know the threats are there. We know that there is abuse of antibiotics. There is no prescription. Anyone can walk to any drugstore and just pick up antibiotics of your own choice. And so the last one is that we have a test in Liberia that is a water test that tests for typhoid. I think the sensitivity should be around 40% or 30%. But that's what we're using right now in Liberia. And everybody gets typhoid and everybody is put on IV ciprofloxacin. Until we can deal with the issue of very sensitive diagnostics, we're going to be abusing antibiotics in, in Liberia and the rest of Africa. Mike, were you going to I just had a, quick, yeah. a point you had asked us, and uh, we none of us really addressed it head on, is the tools for dealing with the AMR. Let me just say right now that I think that the future for antimicrobial research and development and bringing products to the market is going to be very challenging. And the reason is, again, the business model. We keep talking about that. Uh, think about the car salesman who has the best damn car that anyone would ever want, but you got to tell the people who buy it they can only drive it from 10 to 11 on Sunday mornings. That's it. Who's going to buy that car? Well, part of the problem is we're trying to get new antimicrobial agents for very serious issues around drug-resistant infections, but we want you to hardly ever use it, okay? And so trying to incorporate that into the business model is a challenge to in site to you know get people to want to get into that business so it's going to happen but it's going to be challenging but the second piece of this is i last night laid out categories of vaccines we have i'm predicting that in the next five years we're going to see a new category of vaccines it's called vaccines for preventing antimicrobial resistance infections hmm. meaning that we're going to actually start targeting diseases for which we don't have any other really good antimicrobial treatment options, or at least they're very limited. And we are going to make these high priorities. Staph aureus is one, as an example. Um, the second thing is we're going to see unconventional treatments. I predict that within five to 10 years, we will see major emphasis on phage treatment for antibiotic-resistant infections, which is going to be a whole new area that, you know, the Russians are way ahead of us on this one uh, and have been working on it for some time. But I think we're also going to see that as a new Do you want to give a one-liner on the phage treatment stuff? Because I think it's really interesting. Phage is, I think I'm you know, is know. Uh, viruses that infect bacteria. And we've already had some wonderful clinical successes with very, very serious resistant infections where we can match up a virus and actually you treat the patient with the virus that is very specific to that infectious agent. And uh, the Russians did it 
for a long time before uh, uh, you know we, we heard about it or got into it. And uh, there's been several really highly noted treatment successes where people literally were on their last leg with a total resistant infection, and the phages are actually in the work that was being done saved them. It's really a arms race um, between yeah. us and the bacteria, and we're actually playing on both sides of the of the battlefield, which makes it a bit more challenging. Um, if people have questions, please come on up. I'm going to ask one more question of the uh, of the panel, and then again, there's a microphone up there, um, so please come on up and ask questions. The the last question I want to ask um, before we open it up um, is something Masoka just mentioned at the end. Um, so we spend, and when we think about our response tools, we talk about. Um, vaccines, antimicrobials, you know, anti antibiotics, antivirals, um, surveillance system. One of the things we talk a little less about is diagnostics. And diagnostics become a really critical part of this. And I remember thinking in, in, in the early days of the Ebola outbreak, you know, people got fever. Well, we knew most of them did not have Ebola. They often came into centers where they then sat next to somebody else who probably did have Ebola or might have had Ebola. And until the test became you know, positive or negative 48 hours later, like this is the wrong way to do this. But we didn't have any alternative. And so are we prioritizing and investing enough in diagnostics as part of our strategy for keeping the population safe? Really, um, frontline diagnostics. Well, you guys know the story. So any, anybody, if somebody wants to take on, um, how do we think about diagnostics as part of this conversation? And you, no, well, you're not allowed to have nobody take this on. Somebody well, I'll, I'll let me just, because again, having just done the R&D roadmaps for Ebola, Lassa, and NEPA, where we did vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics. So diagnostics was a very key piece. Um, in the middle to high income countries, the private sector is doing very fine with this. And in fact, it's exciting as hell to see some of these like graphene based procedures where we can delineate uh, you know, a number of agents uh, right down to genetic sequencing within minutes. You know, and, and it's going to get more cost effective. The challenge is bringing highly, if, uh, uh, I'm going to say usable diagnostics because of the standpoint of whether electricity based or not, et cetera, sensitivity, specificity, ease of use, to the low and middle income countries overall for this. But as you'll see with Ebola, that's happening. I mean, there's been some major advances made in, in the last several years in just Ebola. So I think actually the diagnostic area, surely the low income countries need assistance and support, but it's actually pretty healthy. And we found that within our work with these diseases that there is a lot of good new technology coming forward. Great. Anybody else want to take this one? Masoka yeah. and then Dennis. I want to speak, uh, because we published a paper called Fee Blood Draw, no one can read it. Basically, in the subsequent resurgence, with the deployment of the gene expert diagnostic that could yeah. run for two hours, yeah. basically, we, if someone got infected or had a fever, we would isolate the person at home, draw blood, take it to the center, that determine the results, and guide back to the person within three hours. And that changed the dynamic of the transmission because yeah. then we kept people at home, they trusted us, we could do the test, and it made such a very big difference when the gene expert was introduced. The speed, the turnaround time. Now we face a challenge. The company that making the gene expert has increased the price of the cartridges and reduced the shelf life of the cartridges. So essentially, the, the gene expert was made and deployed, but we can no more use it because of the cost. Yeah. Yes. And I think it's also important to realize that we're in the midst of a technological revolution. And to the extent that we're not necessarily exploiting that for field applications. And uh, I'll give you an example. We've been supporting up on the China-Vietnam um, border the use of what are called uh, pocket PCRs. They're a little larger than an iPhone. Um, but the big question about and a virus coming, uh, 8, 7, and 9 coming across in the markets uh, into, say, Vietnam, how do you pick that up? The current protocols are you collect samples, you send them back down to Hanoi, they run them through a PCR, they then make a determination and send the information back up, maybe. You're talking about a week. Whatever it is, the traffic to cross that border has been consumed Long in gone. Hanoi already. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's gone. The pocket PCR is this extraordinary uh, tool which is rapidly evolving, but it's basically you can collect samples in a market, 
And against, as long as you have a primer, you can do it against anything. You can do it influenza, you can do coronaviruses, it doesn't matter. And in two hours in that market, you can have a positive or negative. You can know exactly what's there uh, and you can link it to action. So the, uh, the Vietnamese government has revised their protocols now. It does not need to go back to Hanoi. Uh, they are able to stop and quarantine and take actions on the, on the basis of this protocol. Um, and their ability now, the next generation of these, is that they, uh, they immediately move the information into the cloud yeah. so that it's immediately available for access. So, you know, it's how can the global community working with national authorities really move these technologies into the field, point of capture diagnosis. And that's against the known. I'll come back to the fact that we were flummoxed as, um, as Tony was talking about SARS. There was a period of time they did not know what it is. The issue is when something new comes out, we're even more challenged. And I would go back to this issue about developing a deep, rich database about all of the virome to be able to have a diagnostic platform that allows you to rapidly. And so for those that are very interested, you know, I, I am part of, along with a larger community around the Global Virome Project, which is about a 10-year effort to document 70% of the virome within mammal and waterfall populations. Big implications for diagnostics, big implication for countermeasures across the board. But it's a moving from small to big data technology into the field. That's amazing. All right, let's open it up. We have about 10 to 15 minutes. So if we could do two things, which is if I'll take two questions at a time, have whoever on the panel wants to respond, then we'll do the next two. Just please quickly introduce yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Monique uh, Nasser of Meyer Corporation was privileged to lead a team at HHS in 2006 that wrote the requirements for an Ebola vaccine, um, put it in a priority document for our, our medical countermeasure strategy and implementation plan with Dr. Parker. Um, I'm a scientist and a big fan of transformative science, but also realistic expectations. So um, the the deprioritization of one bug, one drug solutions arguably led to the consequence of us not having an Ebola vaccine when we needed one, despite the fact that it was a priority in 2006. So I want to talk about realistic expectations about transformative science and broad spectrum or solutions. One, two is the business model. And Hillary, thank you to you and your team for getting the National Biodefense Strategy long awaited out. Um, I wonder if you have a sense for where we're starting. You talk about the, one of the important deliverables from the, from the federal group is the assessment. Do you have any sense walking into this now with the first national biodefense strategy? Are we at 5%, 10%, 50%, 90%? How, how um, overwhelming or how do you approach sort of this first assessment of the national biodefense strategy? And where are we, you know, after billions of dollars and arguably at least 17 years? of effort. Okay. Well, and go ahead. Let's, next question. Thank you for both of those. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Uh, my name is Eric Moring. I'm a doctoral student in the School of Public Health in Infectious Disease Epidemiology. And there's been a lot of talk this week about uh, vaccines, other med medical countermeasures, some talk about contact tracing. Uh, but one topic that uh, has rarely, if at all, come up is uh, questions and controversies about uh, general restrictions on movement, on closing borders, either at a uh, subnational scale, like between different uh, districts or counties in a uh, Ebola type situation, or or between countries potentially. And we see often in uh, various kinds of public health emergencies, uh, political and other sort of public leaders uh, suggesting that keeping people who might have a disease from traveling is an intervention and. I think in the, the public health community, there's a fairly strong consensus that for most diseases, that's not a good idea. Um, so my, my question is sort of twofold. First of all is, how do you communicate in those situations where that's probably not a good idea? Why something that there might be some intuition to why people think it's a good idea? How do you communicate that that's not generally the case? And then sort of the second part of the question, are there situations where the uh, potential for other control measures is so low and the risks are so large that movement restrictions actually would make sense, uh, even acknowledging that they have severe economic consequences. Great. So a series of questions across both of those. 
um, one bug, one drug, kind of being more realistic about these transformative technologies. Um, one question very specifically to you, Hillary, about this is a great strategy. Where are we on this? 1% or 99? Sure. And then this issue of restricting movement, it does feel very intuitive to people. Most of us, like I cringe when I hear that because I think it's a bad idea. It won't work. It'll make people turn away from the system. All the things that we lay out. And so the question for the panel is, are there times when we may actually but need to resort to that. So whoever wants to start us off. Um. Well, l let me start with realistic expectations. Um, because uh, realistic expectations have embedded in it a time frame. And what is it we expect today? And what is it that we're trying to build for tomorrow? And uh, the older I get, the more I realize tomorrow isn't that far away. Um, because yesterday seems just like a moment ago. And, Part of what you, we need to be thinking about is where are we going to be in 2028? You know, uh, 2008 is literally not that far in the back. And what are the steps that we need to take? Either we begin to ask a different set of questions and figure out what a different paradigm for um, problem solving might be and take those investments. And there's risk embedded in that. Look, when I began my career, uh, I was a researcher at one point and I was at Cold Spring Harbor um, at the moment when the Human Genome Project was first being put on the table. And Jim Watson, who was my boss, right, he was the first lead on that. And it was an enormously controversial uh, discussion. Go after the entirety of the human genome, what are you going to get from that? as opposed to focusing on very specific domains within the human genome. There were wild sort of expectations, lots of promises. The world we got is very different after we've sequenced the human genome. We wouldn't have CRISPR-Cas today if it wasn't for the human genome project having been done. Now, I think part of this is that when you try and make uh, sort of a, a different way of thinking about problems and using data. We live in a data-rich world now. The, the computing power to analyze data allows us to think fundamentally differently. Emerging viral diseases has not kept up. And the transformative issue is in that massive data set are new insights, new opportunities. We're not quite sure what they are. So expectations, be realistic. but. The world is a far more complex environment than Ebola or Marburg. It is a hugely complex issue. And how do we open up the entirety of that window for filoviruses, flaviviruses, et cetera, and then see what the power of big data allows us to understand. So I don't want, you know, this is not a trade-off between making decisions today at the expense of something today. It's about making new decisions to open up new doors for tomorrow. In some ways, I'm reminded of an old line that Bill Gates has been, that's been attributed to Bill Gates, which is we overestimate what technology can do in the short run and underestimate what it can do in the long run. Um, Hillary, on the biosecurity, where are we on the pathway? What is your sense? Yeah, so, um, so I think where we are is we'll know a lot more in 120 days. Um, <laughs> if you look at the NSPM, it has some very specific tasks, what I'm calling the 120-day sprint, where we have to define roles, responsibilities, milestones, metrics, and end states for the implementation plan. So there's analysis that's associated with defining those specific things. And I think that will give us a really good sense of where we are relative to the, uh, the goals, the objectives, and the sub-objectives. I also want to highlight that there is a mandate to release a public report in one year. So this, there is an, uh, um, uh, transparency built into this process so that in one year we'll be able to comprehensively answer that question of where we are relative to the strategy. I think right now if you ask individual departments or agencies they can tell you for their line of effort but there has not been a comprehensive assessment across the US government and that is what we are attempting to do. Okay. Anybody want to take on the, the movement question? Yeah so we did restriction. Uh, like Tony said is a message in the messenger. The first time we attempted restricting the whole population, it resulted in the riot, the military moving, and two persons were shot, and two persons were shot, one died. We learned an important lesson from it. The lesson was that the restriction cannot be external. It has to be negotiated, it has to be discussed. And so we developed a concept called precautionary observation. We did not call it quarantine. So whenever there was an outbreak, we approached the group, 
and discuss with them that for the good of the public, are you willing to stay home? We make the agreements. And on our part, we supply you food, we give you water. There were times we provided television for people, they say we want to watch movies. We give them movies. And we ensure that their jobs got protected. And through what we call negotiated quarantine, we succeeded in doing that. The last fun part, uh, very, I can tell people because a lot of American institutions was involved, was the time we told 32 drug addicts who were exposed and moved them to a center for quarantine. And literally to keep them happy, we supplied them drugs for 21 days. We supplied them cooking for 21 days. Because they were homeless, they were drug addicts, they couldn't live outside. We weighed the risks of spreading the disease. And so we negotiated and they said to us, we are drug addicts. If you guys are going to keep us quarantined, will you provide a drug? And I said, it's an ethical dilemma that I still struggle with. But I literally went and bought drugs and brought it for them. So the message and the messenger, the way you do it is possible it can be done. Um, okay, we're running. So Richard, uh, Mark, let's go ahead and... Okay, Richard, and then uh, we'll take final comments, and then uh, we'll wrap up. Please. I'm Richard Cash from the Harvard School of Public Health. I think Mosaka's comments were absolutely critical because what he was demonstrating is that the uh, the actual epidemiology and the and the value was coming from the country itself, from somebody who's from that country. And what concerns me is we're talking about global, but the fact is that money that goes into training of people locally and in this country is really uh, compared to the rest in really short supply. I believe very strongly that you must develop local institutions, and the number in West Africa and throughout the world is, is pathetically small. Um, I was in Liberia uh, 50 years ago for a cholera outbreak, and the amount of capacity building since that time until the Ebola epidemic was not what it should be. So what I'm interested in is what of all of this money spent and so on should we put into the development of local capacity building. I'm not sure we can trust the United States much more. We almost zeroed out the Fogarty. CDC uh, people can't go out into the field because of travel restrictions. So what are we doing? What should we be doing in terms of national security in developing local capacity to really deal with these issues? Because that's where the answer is going to come from. Great. So we're um, a little short on time. If everybody can just make a comment. And, and if you don't mind working the idea, and you don't, not everybody has to deal with this, but on the issue of trust. Because one of the things that Mosoka did brilliantly in the outbreak in Liberia, but even brings up this, his latest example, is that trust becomes such an incredible um, force, glue for being effective in these things. Um, but really, I'll, I'll leave it open to you. Um, Mike, what, Thank thoughts? you. Quickly, let me just say we're schizophrenic. Uh, we talk all the time about the threat that uh, infectious diseases play to global security, our economic security, et cetera. Uh, this year we'll spend about about $750 billion on the defense and we'll spend maybe $14 billion on all areas of infectious disease and public health control of infectious diseases. Uh, I, I don't know enough about battleships, so I can't say what we need or don't need, but I have a relative sense that if really is that big of a risk, we have to rethink the actual magnitude of how we respond and why and what we invest in. The second thing, I just have to add this piece to my dear friend Dennis Carroll. Uh, I... Uh, I would love to believe in what you're suggesting with all this additional data, but I think that the Viron project is one of the mis most misspent monies we spend today. Uh, I think that it's uh, really provides us really nothing that will prepare us for public health. If we can't get vaccines for what we know now, Ebola, SMAR, MERS, etc., knowing about 5,000 new viruses is like identifying 1,000 new stars and think we're going to have a lower risk of an asteroid hitting the Earth. It just isn't going to happen. And I think that we can't sell that any longer as pandemic preparedness. It's not. I'd love to know the information. I'm curious, too. But until we can get a system to making the current vaccines that we already know we have a risk for, I don't need to know about 1,000 new fellow viruses. I can't have a panel without a little bit of tension. Dennis, any, um, any thoughts? Is this just a pie in the sky, wonderful thing that we'd all love to know, but no. we have to make priorities? Look, this is a, not much of a different discussion than, uh, again, when I was in Cold Spring Harbor in 1986, 87. Uh, and uh, the point is well taken. But it's, it's also, look, 
Vaccines may inherently not ultimately allow themselves to be broad spectrum in a consistent way. You know, it may be that vaccines are inherently a 19th century technology that will always be somewhat limited. But the issue fundamentally is by opening up this insight into the data also allows you to think about what might be new ways of even asking the question. So the whole world of gene editing coming out of CRISPR-Cas allows us to think fundamentally differently about different countermeasures. How do we think about application of those technologies, those approaches, once you begin enriching the data field? So not putting everything on the back of vaccines. I'm not personally convinced vaccines do have that big potential in a consistent way. But um, Mother Nature is an extraordinarily uh, intricate and uh, uh, thing. And getting insight into that requires opening up the data, getting insight. And I think that's where we're going to learn. You know, your viruses, we know about a handful of viruses that you're, you're showing, you know, you're saying the Russians are showing can be enormously impactful on bacterial infections. What other viruses out there might be able to provide an even more robust that we don't know about? Um, so it's, it's not just about one approach or another approach. It's really just trying to rethink the entirety. And uh, yeah. smart people can get smarter. Hillary, any closing remarks on, on any of this? Sure. I'll just um, briefly respond to the last question that was addressed, and thank you for that. Um, I think there is certainly agreement within the U.S. government that responding at the local level and working with our partners to build local capacity is critically important. Um, right now, the U.S. government has 17 partner countries. We're proud to say Liberia is one of our partner countries under the global health security agenda, where we have CDC field offices that work closely with our um, partners to build that local capacity and, and have a uh, mutually uh, learning relationship. And so I think when it comes down to it, and again, you know, coming back to the strategy and what we're trying to do is, broadly speaking, stepping back, what are the risks? What risk can you accept and what risk can you not accept? And then uh, prioritizing your actions accordingly. Great. Masoka, any final thoughts on the? Uh, just to speak to what Dr. Cash have said. Um, the timing in Liberia for me was I had had opportunity to have a U.S. education and so I knew what to do and it made such a substantial difference. But we need to produce many other young people where they did outbreak and, ed and education is going to be very critical. Um, unfortunately, sometimes some of our donors don't see that as a long-term investment because it does not have quick returns. After Ebola ended, we I sat down with a group of guys and we wrote a curriculum in, for an MPH program for the next generation of leaders, apply epidemiology, health system management, environmental health, and laboratory science. We have taken this proposal to multiple international donors and saying that this is the way you, pre you prevent the next outbreak. Nobody is paying attention. We have this proposal, we took it to the university, the faculty senate adopted it as a program. We couldn't even start this year. We got, we're trying to say 2019 if we can start because we cannot have a single donor saying, I will put money here because this is the way I'm going to protect the world by training people locally. So sometimes there's a big uh, challenge with us. They will come in with all the money, but the long-term sustainability is sometimes in you know, But I will tell anyone that the human capacity is the most critical investment because at the end of the day, we we'll still come back to fundamental public health intervention, isolation, contact tracing, the cases. Human capacity is the most important um, area for investment. That's a very good line to end it on. Um, this has been an extraordinary panel. Um, let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you, everybody.